sing another song on uh, hymn number 188, At the Cross, 188. Amen. Thank you, Francesca, for also helping us scoop up Jacob. What a blessing. You know how much time he had to prepare for tonight? About two seconds. Amen. He did a good job, didn't he? He sure did. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Mark. That's right. We're still there. And I would say probably the only way we wouldn't be there is if we were in the air. Amen. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Can you, can you believe it? Ten chapters we have looked at. And you know how I figured that out? All by myself? That's right. We started with the first chapter, and we've just continued through the Gospel of Mark. That's what we're doing, aren't we? We're looking at, we're looking at Jesus from Mark's point of view. Is Mark's point of view better than John's point of view? No, of course not. Not at all. Matter of fact... Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels, uh, are the Word of God. Not one more important than the other or less important than the other. It's a different vantage point, a, an opportunity, uh, and the Lord just m brings all of this together for us to see in a richer, more absolutely vivid uh, way, really, uh, a testimony an account of what took place uh, in the first century, amen? And I'll tell you, it's a big help for me, for sure. Uh, when you can have more than one witness, it just helps out, doesn't it? For sure. So please notice with me, Mark, uh, we're going to look at the first verse, and then we're just going to kind of break it down. That way, I won't keep you here till midnight. Is that okay? Mark chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, look with me, verse 1, verse 1. And he arose from thence... And cometh into the coast of Judea by the further side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him again. And as he was wont, he taught them again. Father, again, we do thank you. And yes, we do want to do this. We really want to just think about this on purpose making a decision right now to kind of settle in 
set aside all the busyness of the day and all the plans for tomorrow and just uh, we just want to settle in and and let you have your way with us and hear from you Lord uh, while we all may come with different uh, needs and uh, Lord we might even be in different places spiritually Holy Spirit of God we know that you already are working and and moving and you will pull up those verses that that speak to us in a special way and of course in this type of a of a preaching teaching series there's much to glean from Lord and so thank you thank you that you're already working we pray in Jesus name amen and amen reality we see in this chapter one really teaching reality you know there are many today who will talk about teaching and doctrine and we're 100 percent absolutely adamant that we need to be preaching the word of god we need to be we we do not we do not dial back on the importance of proper exegesis in other words properly treating the scripture uh, in such a way that we take literally what the Lord has to say to us. If he has something to say to us and he uses an allegory, that's okay. But we can see all of this in the totality of Scripture. But I'll tell you what we don't want to miss out on. We don't want to miss out on the reality of life as a Christian. Life as a born-again believer. You know, some of us grew up on the good side of the tracks. Some of us grew up on the bad side of the tracks. Maybe a few of us got run over on the tracks. I don't know. All I know is, is in the real world, life can be pretty tough sometimes. Wouldn't you agree? And sometimes I think, especially for new believers, they might get the idea that, hey, I'm saved. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to me again. Well, it probably takes, what, about 30 seconds to figure out that that's just not the case. I'll tell you what I'm able to say after many years of knowing the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Thank you that I'm saved because no matter what else might happen, that's the most important truth that I can hold to tonight. And so circumstances can be tough. And people don't get this if they don't study the word of God. But the Lord, even in this block of scripture, this chapter shows us the reality of life, beginning with uh, the reality of marriage and where he stands on marriage. Notice with me, realism of marriage. Realism of marriage. Look with me, verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? Tempting him. Boy, I like the way... Those last two words tell us the heart of the Pharisees. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? Okay, guys, what does the Bible say, right? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement. But, and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. You know, I've never really paid much attention to the fact that he's speaking to them in the present tense about what the word of God said, even though it was written a long time before they were around. He says, for the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. From, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. Well, in the 21st century, we still haven't gotten this part. You know, there are still, this is true. I'm adding a little commentary even before we get to the message. Are you ready? There, there are guys my age. Or go back to the little town I grew up in. There are guys my age that are still living in the basement well, or wherever they can, uh, on their parents' property, and that, and can, I, and you're thinking, <laughs> Abel thought their parents are still alive. I know what you were thinking, brother. Okay, but listen, 
It's the craziest thing. We still somehow, some way, have forgotten uh, the leave and cleave principle, haven't we? We sure have. For this cause, man shall be to look at verse 7 again. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same manner. Again, the disciples didn't want to look like they didn't know that much in front of anybody, so they waited until they were alone with the Lord. And he saith unto them, whosoever shall put away his wife, and this is pretty strong language, isn't it? And marry another committeth adultery against her. You know, that right there can get you in trouble in some circles. Just reading what the Bible says, right? And if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Well, I'll tell you, you know, we could sure spend a whole lot more time here than we have time to spend tonight. But first of all, the question of divorce. The divorce question has always been difficult. The Pharisees tempted to place Jesus in an un in, in, uh, an untenable position with the question. Their motive was to somehow trip him up, which is what many try to do today with Christians. This is one of those areas today that people love to, to challenge Christians and say, your archaic backward thinking does not work in the 21st century. Well, they've been saying that since the, since the first century and even before. You know, all, every generation thinks somehow, well, we're the new enlightened generation. No, old sin is just like new sin. They're the same thing, no doubt about it. And you know, and I know, that if, in fact, we as Christians would recognize the sanctity of marriage in a, and take it much more sincerely, be, uh, be there for that one before they get married to help them to choose the right mate for life we wouldn't have more who call themselves born again Christians getting divorced than the world does and you wouldn't have all the problems that we have today how is it that that, that in fact is the case it's a heartbreaker isn't it it really is and again the Lord always goes back. He, he never dials back in the spirit of the law but he sh or, or the letter of the law, but he wants us to know the spirit of the law. How is your heart, the heart of marriage? Jesus delved into the very heart of marriage. He defined marriage as being when the two become one flesh. Not, let's just try this out for a little while. Let's maybe shack up and see how it goes. Let's just experiment. Let's enjoy some free recreation. Let's do what the world does. No. Marriage is supposed to be sacred. It's supposed to be the second most important decision you'll ever make in your life. He challenged the Pharisees with the command... That, look with me, verse 9. That therefore, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, you know what that's become? Just kind of folklore. It's the language that we're used to hearing. It sounds like a traditional uh, wedding uh, ceremony. No, it's the word of God. It's what God says. And you know, what breaks this preacher's heart is, I can remember nearly 25 years ago, one, one situation where a couple was having trouble, and good, solid, fundamental Christians were just telling these two to give it up and throw it in the towel and, and you know, dump the bomb or whatever the, you know, whatever the situation might have been. They're getting this kind of advice from, yeah, the ones who should be giving them the right advice. Hey, listen, I believe that we need to do everything we can to help 
young people and older people. Uh, you know, my brother uh, Tom Wallace, he is a newlywed. He's only been married for a couple of years. He is a widower, and so is his, his new bride. I wonder if they got marriage counseling. I'm just, just thinking about that. You know? well, how, how would you counsel somebody who's you know, nearly 90? Well, you know, when you get a little older, I don't know. I mean, it's just, it would be kind of interesting to do. <laughs> I've had a couple of others that, did, that actually got married later on, you know. I asked Anita if it would be okay if I did. I just want to see what you guys look, how you'd look back at me when I said that. She said, sure. I'll be praying for that. No, I'll just, I'm just saying. Hey, look, the bottom line is we need to take seriously marriage and we need to help our young people we need to do our very best and hey newsflash parents you have every right to be involved in in your your children's decisions about marriage now i'm not one i'm not going to say i'm totally against it but i'm not for uh you know pre-arranged marriage <laughs> but you know what the bible does say that uh you know we're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers and that tells me that you shouldn't be unequally yoked together with somebody who simply just says, oh, because this is what we think we want to hear. Oh, yeah, I'm a Christian, right? Amen? And so we should work harder at doing that part right. I'm going to not even get to the rest of this. i got to get moving here. But I'm going to tell you what else I believe. And this, call me backwards or, you, well, you can call me anything you want. But I'm here to tell you, once you say yes, once you exchange vows before the Lord, you need to do everything you can to make this marriage work. We need to quit being just like the world and, and throwing in the towel. Now, some would say, preacher, you can't say that because, you know, you even have people in your church that have gone through divorce. They're the first ones to tell me to say this. They're the first ones to step up and say, preacher, preach it, because I, I would not want anybody to go through what I've gone through. I mean, short of death, there's nothing more painful than divorce. I mean, that's just the truth. And the, 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 the worldly idea that, hey, look, you know what? Just dump the bum. You're going to be okay. It's going to be great. That's a lie from the pit of hell. It just is. It just is. And so we see the result of fantasy. The Lord warned against the dangers of neglecting the reality of marriage. To desecrate it is, is to commit adultery. That's, that's what verses 11 and 12 are supposed to be conveying to you. Take this seriously. Divorce is a major, major problem. And it is, and you should recognize what you're doing to the other one. Amen? How about this? You want to talk about realism? Realism of childhood. And I spent probably, that's why I'm saying there's like five messages I'm going to try to squeeze in now. Are you ready? Realism of childhood. Look with me. Verse 13. And they brought young children to him that he should teach them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, Put his hands upon them and bless them. What do we learn from children? A lot. First of all, notice a sincere rebuke. Some well-meaning people rebuked. They were rebuked by the disciples when they brought children to Jesus. Boy, I'll tell you what, be careful. These men did not feel children were a, a, a real you know, issue or of real significance or importance. I mean, how they weren't even grown yet. They were not full people. That was the thinking. Not only of the day, but we, even today we get this idea. Uh, and so that's why they were rebuking those who were bringing children. But then Jesus rebuked them. 
And here is why, the heart of the kingdom. When Jesus became aware of the incident, he rebuked his disciples. He, he taught the children uh, in their simplicity, demonstrated what simplicity of faith is all about. You want to know what will get you in more trouble than anything else? When, you're, when you become so sophisticated, you don't believe anything. I'm just telling you, you ever get around somebody like that and they just, uh, uh, they're so messed up because nothing can be considered absolutely true to them. Sounds a lot like the world, doesn't it? We're to have childlike faith. And that's the result of fantasy. You see, if a person rejects the value of little people, the honesty of little people, oh, may I just say, I didn't say the innocence of little people. How long did it take us before we figured it out that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, including my kids and yours? How about the night they came home from the hospital? That's when we figured it out, amen? But you know what? If we don't, if we don't have a special place in our heart for children, um, the Lord warns us. I mean, it basically... We're rejected. How about this block of scripture? Look at me, verse 17. Realism of salvation. Verse 17. And when he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeling to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do? What shall I do that I may inherit? Eternal life. Boy, it sounds pretty good so far, right? Look with me. Verse 18. And Jesus said unto him, and, and remember the first time you read this verse? Why callest thou me good? Well, for you and I, we're thinking because you are. Well, there's a reason for this. There is none, there is none good but one, that is God. The real truth is, he is God. Notice verse 19. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus, beholding him, and this is key. Watch, watch this. Loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lackest. Go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up the cross, and follow me. And, he, and, and here again, Look at this sad, sad verse, verse 22. And he was sad at that saying and went away grieved for he had great possessions. Wow. First of all, we see a question of concern. An inquirer came and asked Jesus a most important question. Good master, what shall I do that I may, what? Look at the word, inherit eternal life. I mean, he longed for eternal security. There's no doubt about that. But notice, we get to the heart of the issue. And by the way, if you want to talk about reality, the reality of salvation is the most important and significant Issue of the day. There's no other issue more important. Did you know this is more important than what Congress does in January? This is more important than where you work. This is more important than your marriage. This is more important than anything else. You see, this is all about salvation. Jesus outlined a procedure for a man to follow. Uh, this was designed to show the man... He was either, he was neither capable nor willing to earn, yeah, you're not going to earn it, my friend, to earn salvation, to earn eternal life. 
The heart of salvation is found in the command, follow me, follow me. And the result of fantasy, this is, this is what everybody still gets wrong. You know, it's amazing how you would think as much as the gospel has been proclaimed that there would be a few out there that would get it right. You see, the man had hoped for a formula that did not involve sacrifice. In other words, fully trusting the Lord with what? Everything. Jesus emphasized the great cost involved in salvation. Now, I'm not saying, and he was not saying, and Jesus is not saying that you're saved by works. He's not saying that at all. But this, this one was challenged in the area of where his heart was. We've already talked about this, and every time we cross uh, this concern, we like to convey how important it is that we realize that that we may talk about being interested in the things of God, interested in, in salvation even. There are some that can have a pretty inter interesting conversation about, you know, the things of God. But there is something in their life they're not willing to let go of. They're not willing to give up. And the Lord knew his heart, and he knew he needed to go right to that. And I'll say this. This is important that we get this. He loved him, didn't he? He loved this one. And he wanted this man to know the truth. How about this? The realism of riches. Now we're going to go on and teach a little bit about riches. Look with me, verse 23. But whoso, but so shall it not be among you, but whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. And whosoever of you will be of the chiefest shall be servant of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Look with me, verse 46. And they came to, Jer to, to, and they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, Blind Barnabas, Bartimaeus rather, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. As we talked about the realism of salvation. I do, I lost my spot. I think I might have jumped ahead again. Did I do that? You know what? I did this last week. That's what you call consistency. That's what you call consistency. And so now that you have that, you keep that. And you guys were also very polite. Look with me, verse 23. I said verse 23 even and looked, uh, and looked at the wrong verse. Verse 23, not 43. i got to move quickly now here. Watch this. Verse 23. And Jesus looked around about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished out of measure, saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus, looking upon them, saith, With men... It is impossible, but not for God, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. And so here we have difficult circumstances. In light of the rich man's rejection of God's way, Jesus pointed out the difficulty that people have with wealth. Wealth 
can really keep you out of heaven if you let wealth take control, no doubt. But let me just say this. There are many who have less than you or I who are struggling, struggling with placing their focus and their heart on, on, on wealth or desire for wealth or letting whatever they do have control them. The heart of riches. Because of the very nature of wealth, it is impossible for rich people to enter the kingdom of heaven on their own volition. Of course, this is true also of people without wealth. And I think you can also this apply this to other areas of our life that ca captivate us and control us. The results of fantasy, you see... There's reality and then there's fantasy. Jesus taught that unless we, we see the reality of worldly wealth and its lack of spiritual power, we will be tempted to, to place our trust in possessions, in the world, in accumulation. Some of us found out the hard way that accumulating a lot of stuff isn't all that much fun after all, right? When Anita and I got married, everything we owned fit in a Volkswagen Beetle. Two years later, we, 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 went, we came back from Texas to California in a 27-foot U-Haul. What happened? How did that happen? We only had two kids. It wasn't, we could have blamed them. We probably did, but you know, stuff, stuff is just a bunch of stuff. That's all it is. And now let's do this, the, realiz the, the realism of sacrifice. Look with me, verse 28. And I'm going to really make sure I'm in the right place. Verse 28. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have, oh, this is, I, you know what? Settle in with me on this. Uh, you know, I have to make a confession. I, 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 I really relate to Peter. And sadly, it's Peter before he's really filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? Watch this. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. Now that sounds like a pretty nice thing. That's, I mean, hey, somebody ought to give him a pat on the back, right? Watch this. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake. And the Gospels, but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time. Houses and brethren and sisters and mothers, mothers, <laughs> and children and lands and persecution with persecutions and in the world to come. And this is most important, eternal life. Hey, don't tell me how much you're sacrificing. Look at me, verse 31. But many that are first shall be last, and the last first. This is great. This is, this is a message right here we could carve out and preach to all of us for sure, but there are some of us who are in so-called ministry, in Christian service, which should be all of us. We all are. Jesus, Jesus shared the real meaning of sacrifice. That's what he was doing. Because first of all, look at self-centeredness. Peter served as a spokesperson for the group when he said, we have left all and have, have followed thee. He, he longed for some kind of statement of praise from Christ. Hey, you are really something, Peter. You, and you, you guys are amazing. No, 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 no. This was the time to learn a lesson about sacrifice. Again, the heart of the issue. Here, the heart of sacrifice. Jesus shared the real meaning of sacrifice in the statement. There is no man that have left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels but he shall receive an hundredfold now in this time houses and brethren 
and sisters and mothers, I, I still like that, and children and lands with persecutions and in the world and in the world to come eternal life. Peter seemed to, to feel he was, he was due certain merit for his sacrifice. Jesus maintained it should be done for his sake. It should be done for the gospel's sake. And what is the result of sacrifice here? Result of sacrifice? Genuine sacrifice will bring about a blessing in the present life plus eternal life in the world come. Even if you didn't receive any of these things, you're born again, you're saved. And then, of course, because we're really moving along here, I'm trying to remember what part I already read. Did I read this part, verse 32? I'm going to read it again. Verse 32, verse 32. And they were, and of course this is the realism of death. And they were in the way, going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed, and as they followed, they were afraid. And he took again the twelve, and began to tell them what things should happen to him. Now we see this happen often, saying, watch, verse 33, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priest and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. And they shall mock him and shall scourge him and shall spit upon him and kill him. And the third day he shall rise again. That last verse, you may not pay enough attention to the last verse because of everything that you've just heard. But this is, you want to talk about reality? You know what is reality? Death. Death. After you get saved, you are able to, as you grow as in your understanding, recognize the victory that you have because our Savior is victorious. They were frightened. The disciples sensed an impending danger. There was something different about this trip with the master. He starts having this conversation with us about all this. And how about the heart of this matter, the heart of death? Jesus shared with his followers the events that were to transpire in Jerusalem. His death was to be determined by the Jews and carried out by the Gentiles. He was giving them Specific details about what was going to happen. And here we see way of resurrection. Aren't you glad that we serve a risen Savior today? We're able to look back and see this and know this. They should have, and we probably would have made the same mistake and dwelled on what we didn't like hearing, but they missed what they should have heard. As in many other circumstances, Jesus so uh, uh, sought to overshadow this ominous scene of death with the joy of the resurrection. And they, they missed it. <laughs> they only heard the bad. You know, that's the way people are about Christianity, about, about salvation. Most Every time I talk to somebody, I say, now I know you've heard the bad news. I need you to stick around long enough for me to show you from the Bible the good news. Amen? The good news. And Jesus gave them the good news. The resurrection. You see, the, the, the realism of death would be overwhelmed by the realism of new life. And because he is resurrected, we are resurrection Christians. We are, we, we are able to rejoice today. And now I know i got to move quickly. And you know what? You've already remembered what I read when I read verses 35 through 45. How, amen? You say, mm-hmm, that's right, preacher. I was very uncomfortable during that time. Next time, be like Jaime. Say something. Pride of service. Even during the critical hour, some of the disciples were ambitious 
for a worldly honor and duty. You know, Brother Gary, I don't know about you, but for me, I, I'm thinking for any of us who are serving in, uh, in the capacity of a pastor or a missionary, we've got to be careful. We've got to be on guard. And listen, if the disciples can have a problem, even the apostles can have a problem with getting puffed up and prideful, uh, I better be careful to know that it can happen to me and it can happen to you, amen? That's the truth. As a matter of fact, I'm going to throw this in for free. I am very adamant about this. Never be puffed up or braggadocious about soul winning. You say, well, wait, what are you talking about, preacher? Hey, listen, talk up the Lord and thank him for what he's doing. You know, and I still can't get over the fact that he'll use a knucklehead like me. I'm just saying that it's unbelievable that uh, anything can get done. But you know what? That's what's wonderful. And we give praise and glory for a precious one who gets saved. But when we start thinking, hey, look at <laughs> I'm like the best soul winner in the whole wide world. I really am. Matter of fact, there's some people who they just kind of, they, they fall into this, this, this nonsensical notion that I am such a great soul winner that God's even going to overlook sin in my life because, you know, I'm winning people to Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. Be careful about pride. Be careful about getting puffed up. Have a heart of humility. Of humility? That's a new word. Have a heart of humility. You, and you can see why this preacher has to have a heart of humility. Amen? Jesus maintained that honor was something that must be obtained through service. Humble service. Here I am, Lord. Use me. And, if it, and it should begin with the pushing of a... You know what? I'll tell you, the ones who serve the greatest are the ones who will be willing to be the least. They'll be the ones that'll pick up trash on their way in when they're walking through the parking lot. And just always asking, is there anything I can do to help out? And I'm, you know what? I'm talking to that crowd right now. I, I watch and see, and I'm inspired by you. You see, it's not something to be indiscriminately passed around. And uh, you, this is real reality. The results of honor. Genuine honor will be caused, will cause people to be servants to others. There's a metamorphosis that takes place. God does something in our heart. He gets us off of ourselves and he begins to prick our hearts to see the needs of others. We should follow the example of our Savior, the servant master. And yes, we're going to finish this, Lord willing, tonight. Matter of fact, that clock must have stopped because I think I'm finishing early. Are you ready? Verse 46. Verse 46. After we get done with this study, you're going to think, you know, unless I hear the preacher preach 50-something verses, I'm not going to think he did his job. So are you okay? You okay? Verse 46. And they came to Jerusalem, uh, to Jericho, and he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus. This is what I read before, and I'm going to read it again. The son of Timaeus sat by the highway, uh, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried out the more a great deal. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they call the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calleth thee. 
And he, casting away his garment, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus, am I okay? Okay, I'm just making sure. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? Now, Jesus will never ask a question that he doesn't already know the answer to. Watch what he's doing. The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. Well, you want to talk about realism? How about the reality of faith? Realism of faith. First of all, this blind man teaches us much, doesn't he? A blind man came into contact with Jesus outside of the city of Jericho. And what did he desire? He desired his sight. Many centuries later, a, a man who was a captain of a slave ship would get saved, and he would write the words, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. I mean, there is no greater expression of what salvation is really all about than that. And what do we see here? We see the heart condition, the heart of faith. The man, the man got to the heart of realistic faith when he ad addressed Jesus as Lord. He, he had a greater appreciation of who Jesus was than most people who were just simply part of the crowd that was following Jesus. When, when he directed his appeal to the master, he knew that he was speaking to the one who could do something about his problem. That's why we're absolutely adamant that we need to get people to Jesus. Because we see what the results will be. The results of faith, like the faith of the blind man. Jesus maintained that the faith of the blind man had made him whole. Immediately after Jesus recognized the man's faith, the man received his sight. I mean, faith is an eye-opener, isn't it? It really is. And for you and I today, May I say that not every encounter will be like this. We've examined scripture and considered many different ways people have come to the Lord. Not that there are many different roads to the Lord, but people who sometimes are, who are more hard-hearted. Others who are, you know, like the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? And you need to simply say, believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And you know, let's, uh, let's have a glory hallelujah time. And the focus here is, is that without Jesus Christ, you're blind. You are simply blind. And the only way your eyes can be opened is by a touch from Jesus. Salvation is recognizing that the only one, the only one, who can change your condition is Jesus Christ. And you know what? The reason why I call this the reality chapter, one teaching reality, is that there are still a whole lot of people who don't know some very basic truths that are found here in this chapter. And may I just say, there are many who are, who are still today just as lost as those who Jesus was witnessing to 2,000 years ago. And there are many who, who, who absolutely don't understand how important it is that we see the world this way. Jude 23 tells us that when we look at someone, we should, we should see the flames. In other words, unless they trust Christ as their Savior, 
they're going to a, to a hopeless eternity. They're going to a place called hell. And you know, the only hope that they have is Jesus Christ. And I got to tell you something. There's a real need for reality in our preaching and teaching today and in our witnessing today and in this world today. All you got to do is watch a little bit of news, look around at what's going on, and you realize uh, it truly is a lost and dying world out there, completely hopeless without Jesus Christ. Amen? And amen. And next week, we'll see what verses I'll read by accident on purpose next week, okay? Let's look to the Lord. Father, we do thank you, Lord, for tonight. And yes, we do thank you for uh, this time where we really just only have a chance to glance at some of the scripture. For some of us, we are revisiting passages that maybe we haven't looked at in a long time. And for others, maybe we're looking at passages we've never seen before. Whatever the case may be, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for tonight. And Holy Spirit of God, thank you for speaking to hearts even tonight. We pray that we would uh, be receptive and continue to be teachable, allow you to continue to have your way. And yes, even now, as we get ready to pray, might we take what you've given us tonight and, and now use it during this sweet time of prayer, this time of, of looking to you, interceding for others, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen.